it's good though. So on, so so far, no one makes a fool of themselves except me. So it's good. You know, I'm only, <laughs> I'm only, I'm only endangering myself by talking about uh, friends and other, you know, ephemera. Okay, so here we are, week five of understanding the Bible. And I think just so you know, I think we're we're gonna take next week off because my guess is that the diocesan Eucharist will take a little while. And so rather than pushing the, the class back and back, we'll just we'll do that. We'll take a week off and we'll be back. Well, maybe we'll be back on the 25th. Of course, we regather then as well. So it's all the next few weeks are gonna be kind of interesting. We're undergoing a, a little bit of a transition in our worship. Okay, we've talked about the objective. We want to understand the Bible's well, actually, sorry, before I begin, let me pray. Forgot to pray. Let me pray. Lord, um, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for all of your many blessings. Thank you for all the ways that you have sustained us, uh, walked with us, comforted us, kept us, uh, all the ways that you have been our uh, good shepherd, even as we walk uh, through this, this valley of the shadow of death. Um, Lord, I do pray, um, again, that infection rates would stay low. We look forward to regathering on the 25th and between now and then keep us um, healthy and safe and ever cognizant um, of your uh, presence and blessing in our lives. We ask all these things in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so again, um, to understand the Bible's history, structure, reliability, that's the one we're going to focus on today, um, purpose, meaning, in order that we might more fully engage with the Bible's message and importance for our lives. I'm just realizing there's a book I wanted to share with you guys today, but all right, we'll be fine. We'll do it next week. Um, Last week, we had uh, talked about this one little passage here where Jesus, and he says this over and over again, it's in italics here, I have not, I've come to call not the righteous, but sinners. I've not come to call the healthy, but the sick. Uh, that Jesus, um, you know, calls him, uh, you know, people called him actually the friend of sinners as kind of a, a criticism, but he took that on and said, yeah, that's, that's actually exactly right. That's what I am. Um, it reminds me, I don't know if I've told you this before, but the the Impressionists, you know, Manet, Monet, uh, Degas, all the 18th, 19th century French Impressionists, um, that word Impressionist was actually a criticism lobbied against them by kind of the more traditional schools of painting, which preceded them, who said, these guys don't really paint pictures, they just paint their impressions. They just paint their impressions. Mm -hmm. They're Impressionists. And the Impressionists said, yeah, we'll, we'll receive that, we'll take that on. And now what was uh, intended as a uh, criticism um, has become the way that they're they're known, um, and so similarly, people said to Jesus, you know, you you hang out with with drunkards and tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. You're the friend of sinners, and Jesus said, yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly what I am. Um, and unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, the people who were lobbying that charge didn't recognize that they themselves were sinners. Um, but that's uh, that's who Jesus came for. You know, no uh, no no uh, no perfect people allowed. Or as Francis Spufford says, and his is the book I was thinking of sharing with you, um, he calls the church the uh, International League of the Guilty, which I really like. That we're all we're all guilty, and we're all members of that members of that club. Okay, um, so I'm not going to go through this again, but it's just it's helpful. Two main sections of the Bible: 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, um, 27 in the New Testament. Of course, the Old Testament as we said, is broken up into five sections. Uh, the New Testament is broadly speaking three sections, kind of history, letters, and then Revelation is almost a section unto itself, apocalyptic literature, which as we said last week, uh, refers mainly to its own time period, but also to the future as well. But this week we're gonna talk about, uh, is the Bible reliable? Can we trust the Bible? Um, when we pick up a Bible, can we trust that what we're reading is what the original authors originally wrote down? Um, and as I think about that question, I think about all sorts of things I have heard people say uh, over the years, such as, I just heard someone say this the other day, believe it or not, the Bible has been translated and retranslated so many times that it's been corrupted. Anyone ever heard that before? Right? Like, like the, we... we uh, so the NRSV must have just been a translation of the RSV, and the RSV must have been just a translation of the King James Bible, and the King James Bible, who knows where they translated that from, but, you know, it's just, it's, it's more translations piled on top of each other. How can we possibly trust it? 
Well, just so you guys know, whenever a new version of the Bible comes out, and there are many, right? There's the NRSV, there's the NIV, there's the ESV, there's the NASV, there's the Good News Bible, there's all these yeah, different Bibles. Whenever a different translation of the Bible uh, is made, they don't go back to previous English translations. They always go back to the original Greek and Hebrew text. Okay, they're always going back to the beginning. Um, and whenever they do this, they always gather like the 50 or 60 best scholars they can possibly find, you know, all the kind of experts in their field um, and all the experts in, you know, the mosaic literature and the Psalms and the specific books and the history. And they all get those people together to create the new translation. And it usually takes two or three years to do. And on top of that, every time they make a new translation, uh, they've discovered new manuscripts, right? Because archaeology is being done all the time. People are always looking through old libraries. New things are always being discovered. And so to some degree, um, you know, you can, you can always count that the newer translations that are coming out are going to be more accurate and more reliable than the ones that came before it. And I'll just say a word about this too, because it's kind of interesting. You know, the, the idea of translating the Bible from its original Greek and Hebrew actually only goes back to like the 16th century. There was this movement called humanism, which was led by a Dutch Catholic named Erasmus, who there's some reasons I don't like him because he got into a big debate with Luther and, and I think I like Luther a lot more, but what Erasmus did do, he was one of the first people in um, hundreds of years who was actually able to read classic Greek and classic Hebrew. And at that time, the translation of the Bible that was being used in the Catholic church and had been used for like a thousand years was called the Vulgate, which was a, which was a Latin translation that was made by Jerome in like the fifth century, something like that. And so that was the same Latin Bible that the Catholic Church had been using for like a thousand years. And once Erasmus came along and, and could finally, for the first time in a long time, so was someone who could understand the original languages, he started to look back at the original languages and recognize that the Vulgate, this Latin translation that the, the Catholic Church had been using for a thousand years, wasn't really that good. And so he started to agitate for more contemporary translations. Um, and that was the moment where like Luther translated the entire Bible into German. Um, that's roughly contemporaneous with when the King James Bible came out, which was the first, you know, uh, translation of the Bible into English, where all of these, where the Bible started to become available to people in their own language, in their vernacular. Before that, it was only available in Latin, and the only people who could read Latin were the priests, and most of the times, even the priests couldn't read Latin. And so they would read these things, you know, they would read the Bible in Latin to the congregation and they would say the mass in Latin and no one would understand what they were saying. Okay. Unless you happen to be like a, a, a seminary pro a professor, a university professor uh, uh, in the, you know, at the Vatican and were very learned, maybe you understood Latin, but by and large people did not And so again, it was in the 16th century with this humanist movement whose motto was ad fontes, to the, to the founts, to the sources. Let's go back to the original sources and do another translation of the Bible based on the original Hebrew and Greek. And then out of that flew, uh, um, flowed the Pro Protestant Reformation. Because all these scholars started to say, wait, 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 wait. All these doctrines that we've learned from the Catholic Church, specifically put out by the scholastics, which was the, the major theological movement which preceded the Reformation, are more Aristotelian, are more Greek in nature, and pagan than they are Christian. They're, they're not actually based that much on the Bible, on the New Testament. And so they're like, we need to sort of change course here. And even though Erasmus, Erasmus was interesting. He definitely made some Catholics angry, some popes angry, but he also stayed Catholic to the end and he defended the papacy to the end. Um, uh, so he didn't actually ever become a Protestant. But of course, Luther did, and, and Calvin did, and Cranmer did, and Zwingli, and all the other guys. And what people say is that Erasmus laid the, laid the egg which Luther hatched. That's what people say. Erasmus laid the egg which Luther hatched. Because in, in being the first one to be like, wait, the Vulgate isn't an accurate translation. We need a new translation. That's what led to the Protestant Reformation. So that's kind of interesting, right? But since then, I got to say... Um, you know, we've pretty consistently had pretty good translations of the Bible in our, in the vernacular. 
Now, the, the modern translations, I think, are better than the King James. King James may be more beautiful. A lot of people love King James. You know, there are some denominations who insist that only the King James is the revealed word of God, which I find hilarious, right? It's like, well, you know, what do they say? If the King James is good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good for me. <laughs> Except, you know, the Apostle Paul didn't speak English. Um, and there are many wonderful things about the King James. It's beautiful. It is highly accurate. Um, in some ways, actually, I don't want to say invented the English language, but it definitely, how do I say this? It, um, it, brought, it, it brought the English language into focus. It gave it agreement. It, it, up until then, all people spoke all sorts of different dialects all over the English-speaking world. But now suddenly, you had one book, which was available in every church, available to everyone, which had the same approach to English. And in a lot of ways, uh, the King James Bible sort of um, created and formed English as we now know it. So it's a hugely important book. But all that is to say, this all goes back to this idea. You can't say the Bible has been corrupted because it's been translated and retranslated because whenever a new translation is made, it is always made from the original source materials of which they are always discovering more and more. Okay, so hopefully we can throw that one out. Next one, we, these won't always take, take so long. Christians throughout the centuries have edited the Bible to make it fit with their beliefs. Eh, yeah, I mean, there are a couple instances of that. Like for example, at the end of the Gospel of Mark, we talked about this, did we talk about this? Maybe. The end of the Gospel of Mark, there's this really funny passage where, where Jesus appears to his disciples and he says, here I am, I'm back from the dead, and here are the signs of my disciples. They will um, be bitten, they'll be bitten by snakes and they'll drink poison and they won't die. And, and there's this little paragraph or two paragraphs that are completely out of step with the rest of the Gospel of Mark. So it seems pretty clear because the way the Gospel of Mark actually ends is that the women show up to the tomb and it's empty and it says they were afraid, the end. Okay, the resurrected Jesus doesn't actually show up in the Gospel of Mark, believe it or not. But it does say there's an empty tomb and the women were afraid. Um, so someone may have come along and been like, yeah, this is a little weird. Maybe we should add something to sort of spice it up at the end or, or you know, have Jesus appear in the Gospel of Mark. But here's the thing. If you pick up any modern translation, it will say to you the earliest, the earliest translations or, or of the Bible we have do not include this section. They'll be very clear about that. And so we have so many manuscripts now, we can clearly tell that that was added after the fact. And there just aren't that many examples of that. Okay, they're like a, a couple here and there. But by and large, you know, it seems like as we look at older manuscripts, what we, as we look at compare older manuscripts to newer manuscripts, they're really pretty consistent, which makes sense because before the printing press, copying a Bible was very painstaking, labor intensive work. And the people who did it were monks who, who believed they were handling the word of God. And if you think you're handling the word of God, you're going to do your best not to mess it up, okay? Um, and like I said last week, the fact is that the, the four Gospels don't totally agree with each other. Like Mark, in Mark, the resurrected Jesus doesn't show up. And, you know, the New Testament seems to bear witness that there were some pretty significant debates between Paul and James and Peter. And if you were trying to, to make it all harmonize, it seems to me like you take that stuff out. And you also would probably try a little harder to make the disciples not look like such complete idiots. You know, like that's the other remarkable fact about a lot of um, uh, his works of antiquity. They tend to glorify their heroes and make them look superhuman. Okay. The Bible doesn't do that to like Paul and Peter and, you know, it, it makes them look like the broken, fallible human beings they were. Now it does do that to Jesus because, you know, Jesus seems to be, uh, you know, God in the flesh. And yet, you know, um, Jesus also says some very challenging things, like the story in the gospel he told this morning where the poor guy without the wedding cloak gets cast into hell, which you'll notice I didn't preach on next time. Next time it comes around, I'll preach on that. But um, okay, next objection. The Bible is so old that it doesn't have any relevance for us today. Well, all you have to do is read the Bible, and I don't think that's true. Like I said this morning, Psalm 23 is 3,000 years old. It still kind of moves me to tears. <laughs> you know, like people are people and seem to have been throughout the ages. Sure, there are some parts where you're like, what are they talking about? But I think by and large, I don't know, it seems to still connect, which is why people still read it today. Okay, other objections. The Bible is so full of contradictions, we can't trust it. I talked about that. Yes, there are some contradictions. I wouldn't say it's packed full of contradictions, but in some ways the contradictions to me enhance the reliability because it doesn't seem like there's been a ton of effort 
um, extended to make it all harmonize. Um, and as I said before, when you have four different eyewitnesses to the same event, you're going to get four different stories about what happened. And yet the broad sweep of the biblical narrative seems to be pretty consistent, especially considering it was written by 40 different people over the course of thousands of years. Um, maybe a few more. The Bible talks about miracles, and since we know that miracles can't happen, it can't be true. That's kind of the, the Thomas Jefferson approach to the Bible, right? Where he took the New Testament, cut all the miracles out, and said, there's a Bible I can believe in, because he wasn't a Christian, he was a deist. It's like, well, okay, but that's kind of the point of miracles, right? That, that they, they can't be explained by science. So if someone shows up performing miracles, my guess is people would write it down. And for anyone who's ever experienced a miracle, anyone here ever experienced a miracle? Or what they would term a miracle? I think I've, I've experienced some things that I'm like, I can't really explain that. Um, people seem to be less hostile to the idea of miracles than they used to be. For example, there, there was some poll in Finland, something like, you know, Finland's kind of, even though it's a, technically a Lutheran country, it's pretty post-Christian, but something like two thirds of Finns actually really believe that there are elves living in the forest. <laughs> you know, people seem to, and like, just think about all the people who watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer and like really, really want to be a witch, you know? People seem to have less trouble with miracles than they used to. Okay, uh, the Bible is just like any other religious book, like the Quran, the Book of Mormon, a good story maybe, but not true. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But as I said, the Quran and the Book of Mormon are striking in that they were written by one person at one time in one place. Uh, whereas Bible is written by many different people in many different places over a vast period of time. Um, it's a library, not a book, um, and seems to, it seems different in character to me. All right, what else we got? Ooh, a lot of books were left out of the Bible because they didn't fit the agenda of the people who put it together. We'll talk about that later, right, about how the, 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 the canon, quote unquote, specifically the New Testament canon came to be, and why like the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Mary or the Gospel of Peter were left out. That was the passage I wanted to find, wanted to read to you from Francis Spufford because he's really funny on this. But when we talk about putting together the Bible, I'll, uh, I'll find that and read it to you. But I think what I would say to you, if you're concerned about that, go and read the Gospel of Thomas, read the Gospel of Mary, read the Gospel of Peter, and see what you think. Because to my ear and my eye, they are just different in character and they feel more um, Gnostic, more mystical, more kind of Greek than they do Jewish, honestly. They don't, they just, I don't know, they, they, sound, they sound like a legitimate superhero story, whereas uh, the, 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 uh, the canonical gospels have more of a ring of historical accuracy to me. But if you've read those, and I'm more than willing to talk about it. Okay, uh, the authors of the Bible made it all up to suit their own desires. Well, okay, except they were all killed for what they believed. So if they, were, if they were making it up to sort of empower themselves, it didn't go that well. Okay, let's stop there for just a minute. Any, um, wait, because the next thing is, wait, wait, let me look at my next slide. Where did you all go? Get back to my Zoom. Let me unmute you. Okay. Any thoughts, question, comments on anything I've just said with regard to common objections to the reliability of the Bible or any ones I didn't mention. Need to unmute. Any ones I didn't mention? Any questions? Yeah. Yes, Rob Gorman. Um, there is another um, objection that some people raise, one of whom is, a, is a, an Episcopal bishop. And he says, yeah, you know, the Bible is not a historical record and so on. And actually, a bunch of the New Testament is actually sort of embellishment uh, that was added as a PR um, to add to make it more saleable. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, and then and that 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 there is one book in particular where they point out all of the factual contradictions. You know that. Christmas couldn't have taken place at this time because these trees were in bloom and Easter couldn't have possibly been, you know, and things like that. And the contradictions about, you know, very basic things, you know, where was, where did the robbery take, robbery take place? Was it a liquor store or was it a bank? You know, <laughs> um, eyewitnesses would not differ about that. You know, they might differ about 
Well, I, I would I would like to say that book. I mean, I think it probably is true. There has been some debate about whether Christmas actually happened in, in late December or whether it was a different time of year and might have been moved um, to sort of take over the, the winter solstice festival, honestly. I think some people have said it, it might have been a different time of year. That kind of stuff, that doesn't bother me that much because it doesn't, nowhere in the Bible does it say, or the New Testament, that Jesus was born on December 25th. You know, it, it sort of, it does give some accounts of, you know, when Quirinius was governor of Syria and, and there was, you know, um, you know the Caesar called for the, all the world to be taxed and it talks about places, but that kind of stuff just doesn't bother me that much. I mean, it does seem like the crucifixion and resurrection do kind of line up with Passover. Like that makes sense, right? Because that's all, all the Jews were there. And then also Pentecost took, took place on the, the Feast of Weeks you know, which was a big um, Jewish festival about seven weeks after, um, the big harvest festival, seven weeks after uh, uh, the Passover. So those kind of contradictions don't, I mean, that's not really a contradiction, right? They're, like there's another bishop who said, you know, he thought it was ridiculous that Jesus ascended upwards when we know that, you know, oh, people used to think that heaven was above us, but now we know that it can't be above us because, you know, that's what the stars and the whatever are. It's like, well, okay, but what was he supposed to do? Like, dis like descend downwards? That would have been a weird look, you know, move sideways, <laughs> you know, like, um, like think about the context and the people that, that were sort of writing, like to some degree, it makes sense that he would, that he would ascend up, right? Like that's where we, we think of God being above us. And so. Or dematerialize um, like on Star Trek. Just yeah. <laughs> beam me up, Scotty, right? He didn't say beam me up, Scotty. Um, and I do think as we talked about a few weeks ago, right? When, when you say the Bible is not intended to be a historical record, it really depends what part of the Bible you're talking about, right? Because there are some books that are intended to be like Jonah. Is Jonah a story about repentance or forgiveness, or did it, or was there a guy Jonah who actually preached at Nineveh? Like there can be debate about that, right? Was Job a real person, or is it a meditation on on, on suffering, right? But when it comes to like the Pauline letters and the Gospels, it seems like they, they're intended to be history. So that's how I'm inclined to to read them. And in terms of the PR thing. I don't know what to say about that, man. Like, it's such a, it's such a weird, it's such a weird, funny story, right? Like that, and again, when, when Mary Magdalene and the other women show up at the tomb, they're not expecting to find anything. And the, and the, the apostles think, think it's all over. Um, and why would you want to join a movement where everybody is just getting killed? <laughs> you know, um, there's nothing to gain. There's no money. There's no buildings. There's no fame. There's, there's one no... going on right now on TV, in case you hadn't noticed. Wait, what do you mean? What's, yeah. what's going on TV? No, 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 no. Popularity contest? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I don't know. But, but that's the thing. Like, no one was fighting to be in the White House and have political power. Like, they're all fighting. Yeah, Lou, yeah, let's join him with all these people that are being thrown to the lions and burned at the stake. That sounds amazing. And what happened to your leader? He was crucified? Perfect. Sign me up. <laughs> You know, it just, it, it's just, it's, it's a, it's an absurd thing. The idea that you would worship someone and, and, and Fleming Rutledge makes this point really powerfully in the beginning of her book, The Crucifixion. Like we only think of the crucifixion as being physically painful and torturous, but it's more than that. Like it was invented by the Roman empire to be the most humiliating action that could ever be visited upon a human being. Right. And the idea that you're going to worship someone that that happened to is just like, it's doesn't, it do, 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 does not compute, you know? Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe it was all big, big, big PR stunt. Even then, I mean, the last thing I'll say is, you know, as I said a few weeks ago, like the, the, the earliest, the oldest book in the new Testament is not the gospels. It's first Thessalonians, actually Paul's letters a lot, you know, either predate or contemporaneous with the Gospels, which doesn't mean that the stories weren't being told. It just means that it hadn't been written down yet. But what that means is that all these assertions about who Jesus was and what he had accomplished, what his death and resurrection meant about him being God in the flesh, those actually predated the, the stories about Jesus' life, which is interesting because usually the life comes first. And then a couple hundred years later, people are like, well, you know what? maybe that guy Jesus was God, you know, maybe, eh, you know, maybe like, like layers of legend get added on top of the historical, of the historical recounting. But in this instance, the assertions about who Jesus was predate the, the writing down of the stories, which is interesting, right? So the people are saying that Jesus is God 
very early on, which almost like never happens. Um, so again, all this stuff is a matter of faith a little bit, but to me, the question is, um, can you be a, a reasonable human being with some intellectual uh, um, uh, veracity and consistency and still dare to believe that the Bible can be trusted? You know, so that's, to me, that's the big question. All right, anything else? I have a question. Yes, Mr. Revanelli. Uh, going back to your idea that all all um, other all all books of the Bible are based on the same history, the same readings and stuff, um, I I use what I consider to be a rather scholarly Bible, which is the New Oxford Annotated. Lovely. And I also have was gifted a Bible that you can color in. And that Bible is very much in the common vernacular. It's very um, homespun. Uh, it's, it, seem, it strikes me that it is very much of its own mind. And I'm curious, even if you use old manuscripts and new manuscripts and always go back to the sources, how does the Bible change to... Uh, <laughs> If you if read your like the, the is, Bible or something. If your <laughs> the, purpose is to be more in the common vernacular and not necessarily to be so scholarly. So what I would say about that is I'm fine with it, actually. You know, I'm fine with the message and the good news Bible and the new living translation. Like as long as their theology is, is pretty good. Like, you know, I love the Jesus storybook Bible. Like I talk, I almost, if someone's never read the Bible, I'm almost like read this first and then read the Bible. You know, um, but there's a reason for that. And I think I mentioned this in a sermon I gave once. There, there's a, a, a very famous missiologist, right? A, a person who studies the, and who's been a missionary and writes about missionary movements and all that sort of stuff. And he says um, that the reason why he has no problem with the Bible being translated into all these different languages is because the message of Christianity is that in Jesus, God translates himself into human. And that the distance between the divine and, and man, humanity, you know, humanity is, is so much greater than the distance between Greek and English or Hebrew and French or you know, vernacular, non-vernacular, that, that really the whole purpose of the Bible is to communicate this story. So however you can best do that, you know, that's okay. And, and you know, when, when the King James was written, it was in the vernacular. Right now you read it and you're like, eh, it's beautiful, but it doesn't quite fit anymore. Like you want to reach for your NRSV a little bit. So, you know, to know. And again, there, there are, there are um, like the NASB, the New American Standard Bible is about the most literal translation. So if you really want literal word for word, you read that. It's a little bit stilted. But if you want to read something that's a little easier to read, then go to something else, right? But what matters is the Bible, as, as Luther says, the, is the manger that holds the Christ child. And as long as the person and message of Jesus comes through, I think that's okay. What Remember difference also is, right? that we are, um, we're very fortunate in the history of the world in that A, we can read, and B, like we have access to the Bible, right? So the, the printing press was only invented 500 years ago. And for the first 1500 years, Bibles were expensive, you know, and, and, and reserved. And, and, and even if you could get one, you couldn't read it unless you could read Latin, which like I said, most people couldn't. Um, so for a long time, that's all people had to go on. Um, and Jesus told stories, you know? So I'm okay with it. Again, read the Bible as you can, not as you can't. But if you have a question and something seems unclear, then yeah, find something that seems more scholarly or compare translations, you can do that too. But you're confident for the most part that the Bibles are consistent in their storytelling. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this is going to sound, I don't want to be like mean, but uh, I don't know if I would read a Bible that like a Mormon gave you, <laughs> you know, because sometimes Mormons will say like, well, you know. Well, I, that's, that's, that's kind of my point. You know, yeah. if, if somewhere there's a translation that comes along that instills more of your personal religion and your personal beliefs. Yes. Uh, and it, and yeah. it dizzies you because you can also color a butterfly while you're reading you know, maybe suddenly 
you start thinking a different way. That's what I... Um... Yeah, I mean, I guess here's the last thing I'll say, and I'll default to this. Paul talks about, I can't remember what letter is, but people are complaining about other people being like, they're not talking about Jesus the right way. You know, and Paul is like, look, at least Jesus is being talked about, <laughs> you know, like, right. praise God for that. So if someone wants to read a Bible, like, uh, I'm not going to tell them that's the wrong translation, you know, okay. like right. find a translation that works for you and like go to town. Um, but for, but for yourself, like, yeah, you're right. You want to find the best, you know, the most readable, most accurate version you can find. And I, and, and for, to, for my money, although I haven't read it in a while, the, the tra- and, well, I shouldn't even say this. But the translation that seems to strike the best balance to me is actually the English Standard Version, the ESV, because it's a good balance between literal, but it's also really well written. Oh, look at you. Cat's got an ESV. Special points for cat. All right. So there you go. Uh, You can get it on Kindle for free on the ESV. Really? Oh, my goodness. But again, it's not perfect, you know, but that's, anyway, if you're looking for another translation that might be interesting. Okay, anything else? Okay, share screen. Uh, <laughs> my wife just texted me, said I seem chipper. So, <laughs> as opposed to usually when I'm just a miserable sack. Okay, I like problem that about with you being chipper? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, here, I like what this guy says John Warwick Montgomery. I mainly like him because he went to Berkeley. But he says, to be skeptical of the resultant text of the New Testament books is to allow all of classical antiquity to slip into obscurity, for no documents of the ancient period are as well attested bibliographically as the New Testament. Now, what that means is that if you don't trust the New Testament, you should not trust Plato, Aristotle, Caesar, maybe Shakespeare, even though that's super late. Um, Herodotus, Tacitus, like any of those old, if you're like a classics major, a philosophy major, any of those old books that you have read and been like, oh yeah, that, if I've, I've read, if you've read The Republic and been like, I've read Plato, The Republic has so many fewer copies than the New Testament, it is ridiculous. So if you're going to trust any of those other books, you should trust the New Testament. And conversely, if you don't trust the New Testament, you shouldn't trust any of those other books. Is that clear? You heard what I'm saying? And now let's, let's look briefly at what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, what more do I want to get through? Okay, so when we look at the reliability of the Bible, two big questions. The first is, is what we have today what the original authors originally wrote down? And the second is, were they telling the truth? Right, those are the two big questions we need, that need to be answered about any book's reliability. It, yeah. They speak for themselves. So within that question, is what we have today what the original authors originally wrote down? There are two more questions wrapped up in that. How many manuscript copies do we have? So how many, because all the, like the, the Gospel of John is lost to history, right? Ephesians is no more. All we have are copies that other people made. And the question is, how many copies do we have? And how close in years are the copies we have to the original date of writing, right? So how many copies and how old? Because if they were written, if they were copied a thousand years later, that's different than if they were copied 200 years later, right? So th that's how we determine reliability. So for example, we'll do a quick comparison of documents of antiquity. If you look at Plato and Herodotus, they were written in the fourth, fifth century BC. The earliest copies we have are from 900 AD which is a time span of roughly 1,200 years, and we have seven copies of Plato and eight copies of Herodotus, to give you an idea, okay? Suetonius, Thucydides, Caesars, Gallic Wars, Tacitus, they're, Aristotle, they're all roughly the same, right? That the earliest copies we have are always about 1,000 years after they were originally written, maybe a little more, 800 to 1,400 years, and we have somewhere between seven copies and 50 copies. And for Aristotle, 50 copies is pretty darn good. We had 50 ancient manuscript copies, even though the earliest one we have is 1400 years after it was written, but no one picks up their Penguin Classics edition of Aristotle and doubts whether or not he, whether it was his real thinking, right? 
Okay, the second best attributed book of antiquity is the Iliad, which makes sense because it was the Greek Bible, right? If you wanted to know what the gods were like in, in pagan Greece, you read the Iliad. It was written about 900 BC, even though the stories predate that. The earliest copy is 400 BC, which is kind of amazing, only 500 years. And it's probably more now, but last time I checked, it was 643 ancient manuscript copies. So probably, let's say 650 now. So that's pretty good, right? That kind of blows all these other works of antiquity out of the water. But now look at the New Testament. Oh. And now I gotta do this all again. Darn technology. <laughs> okay, New Testament was written between 50 and 100 AD. The earliest copy or shreds we have, and that's true for all of this, the earliest shreds are 125 AD, which means that the, at the earliest, there's a gap of about 35 years between when something was written and the earliest shreds we have. And the number of manuscript copies we have are more than 24,000. Okay, and that's in all sorts of different ancient languages, Greek and Hebrew and Ethiopian and Latin and, you know, all these different languages. And so what that means is that when scholars go back and they make a translation of the New Testament, they have more than 24,000 manuscript copies to work from, some of which date to within 100 years or less of when the original books were originally written. So this is what John Warwick Montgomery means when he says that to allow the books of the New Testament to, 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 to say they're unreliable means that you're allowing all of antiquity to slip into obscurity because no book of antiquity is better attested than the New Testament. Okay? That's kind of cool, right? I think that's kind of cool. I think we're, we're going to stop there um, because I got to get out to do communion. Um, but any questions about any of that? I would just like to make a comment about um, what Missy was saying about the new Oxford annotated Bible. Yes. I find that to be a real treasure. It's got the Apocrypha. It's got all these footnotes and references and indexes and maps. And also, that's what they were using down at our diocesan school in Fort Lauderdale. Awesome. Yeah, if you can get a study, any study Bible that has notes and introductions to the books, and that can be so helpful. Yeah, I mean, my, my wife, when she was kind of becoming a Christian, had a NIV study Bible, and man, she marked the heck out of that thing. You know, that can be a very helpful, uh, helpful guide. And I do like, I got to say, I like the little introductions that we have a, a history of doing mm -hmm. here at Holy Trinity. I know those yeah. went away for a few months. I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad we do those because I think we're, we are a congregation who cares about the Bible and wants to know the context. Um, and so I, I, I love that. I love that about us. Anything, is this anything else? Is this new information to any of you? Is this stuff you've heard before? Mm -hmm. Do you find this encouraging, <laughs> confusing? What do you think? I love the comparison of the documents of antiquity. I, I yeah. wish you'd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do too. I well, that I do too. I am putting my notes online, just so you know. If you go to um, holytrinitywpb.org slash forum, I organize them by weeks. And so um, I'll put this one up too. It'll be under week five. And I kind of, I, it'll be, you know, notated as the reliability of the Bible. Um, yeah, I think so too. Like when I first saw it, I was like, holy moly. <laughs> like it's just not even close, you know? And that's not something anyone tells you. Like there's this, there's this impression that somehow like the New Testament is on kind of shaky ground. And it's like, yeah, like people mm. might not believe or like what it says, but no one is going, you know, no one except for like these Jesus seminar, you know, buffoons um, are going around saying like that it's, 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 you know, any, any honest archaeologist historian, I think, has to respect the, the, you know, the New Testament. It's kind of an amazing thing. And we haven't I think anybody so that's, anyone that's a skeptic anyway would have a hard time understanding even all of it. The parables and everything are not something you just read and say, oh, yeah, I get it. No, that's true. And that's why um, some of it you can read and get. Right, like I, I think I told you the story about a friend of mine, this guy, my friend Paul, who is an astrophysics major at Yale and like super smart, but had never read the Bible, which to me is so classic. So I gave him a Bible 
and I said, just read like the Gospel of Matthew or Luke or something and tell me what you think. And he got it, you know, because he, he thought Jesus was all about morality. He thought Jesus was about rules and about, and I think I told you, I said, so, so Paul, what, you know, what do you think? A few months later, he said, well, Jesus is way different than I was expecting. He's like, he's a total wild man. I was like, yes, he is. And I was like, what do you think his, the essence of his message was? And he said, uh, the essence of Jesus' message was, um, you guys are all a total disaster. And, uh, you know, to hell with it, you're all forgiven. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I was like, yeah, man, I like it. That sounds about, I like that. Inter- like, if you can just read it once through, and that's your interpretation. Like, that sounds pretty orthodox to me. Um, so I agree with you. There's some stories you read and you're like, what? Um, but then some story, yeah, I don't know. It, it needs some interpretation, but I think it still speaks, hopefully. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, well, let's end. What can I pray for today? Our country. Okay, our country. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Good Good humor, yes. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for your ministry. Thank you um, that people wrote it down and people copied it and we can read it today, that we can encounter you and all of your uh, complexity and um, uh, some, yeah, sometimes you're very transparent, sometimes you're totally opaque, but you never fail to surprise. So thank you for the gift that that is. Um, I do pray for our country, Lord, especially, man, as we head into election season. I pray that your peace, uh, your grace, your empathy, um, your justice would reign, Lord, that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, Please bind us together in your love. Help us to be instruments of your peace, as St. Francis asked. Um, Give us hope. Help us to remember who we belong to, the kingdom uh, in which we find our true citizenship, and help us to love our neighbors uh, as, as you love us. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone.